Let's look at verse 37, 38, 39. If you have a study Bible, take a look, and you'll see that we're he's quoting Habakkuk. Habakkuk. 2, 3, and 4. Now, notice that verse 37 begins with a 4. That's a gar, which is kind of, it's a conjunction. It's, if you got one, you look back, and verse 36 got one, and it's connected to therefore. It says, therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has great reward. Therefore means why for, therefore, it's back to 34, where they were un in undeserved suffering and were uh, and he, they were encouraged to accept joyfully the seizure of their property for Christ undeserved suffering for Christ knowing that you have better possessions and abiding ones therefore don't throw away your confidence which has great reward he just talked about that and he's going to talk more about it Four, you have need of endurance, because this is undeserved suffering, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what was promised. We, we talked about, for one thing, would be the crown of life, James 1.12. Then he introduces Habakkuk. He says, for yet in a very little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, withdraws or goes AWOL, my soul has no pleasure in him, is not well pleased with him, is how that should read. But we are not of those who shrink back to destruction, a metaphoric preposition but of those who have faith to the preserving of their soul, metaphoric prepositional phrase again is a really important. When the writer is talking on a subject and interjects um, Old Testament quotations, of course that was their Bible, wasn't it? At this time, the New Testament is in, in the writing process. You pay attention to what they're picking out because they're they're using it as a support will of God, trying to support the scriptural idea, just like we do in the New Testament. So Habakkuk, the second chapter, verse 3 and 4, is going to be dynamite to understand this. Now, the second thing that's going to be important for you to understand this is the Bible they were using in their day, like we would use the English Bible, either King James or NAS or something like that. Their Bible was the Septuagint. That's the Greek translation of the Hebrew. That was their Bible, the Septuagint. You'll often see it identified by the Roman, Roman numeral for 70. Okay? That, which will be important because we'll refer to it. I said all of that to tell you, you will never understand this passage without knowing that background. You will never understand this. Never. <laughs> because I've heard the sermons off of this stuff is wild. You'll never understand unless you understand those basic things. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to come in here, and we're going to deal with 37, 38, 39. Notice that 39 is a conclusion. But we are not of those. See what I mean? See, he stopped quoting, didn't he? And he started preaching. <laughs> he's, he's, and, and he's concluding an enormous section called the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. Right? which I we only studied 8, 9, and 10, but it goes way back to 5. Actually, it goes back to the first chapter. But I, I just took, and so I thought, 
th th I've got two more studies in cleaning this one up. But um, we we did chapters eight, nine, and ten, and because there's so much, they're loaded with so much uh, doctrine of the new covenant that um, this will be our fifty fiftieth do doctrine from chapters eight, nine, and ten. This is our fiftieth tonight, and I have I have two more. So let's have a word of prayer. Because you're going to need your thinking cap on tonight. You're going to have to think and cap. Second, Second Peter three sixteen. This is going to be one of the things you're going to you're going to need the Holy Spirit to teach you tonight. So I say to you, the Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people for spiritual living. You can't study it nor live it in carnality. Evidence of carnality in the Christian life is personal sin. It could be. Of at least three categories. It could be mental attitude sins, sins of the tongue, or, or overt sins. If you're aware of them, and you should be, if you have any understanding of the ministry of the Spirit and the Word of God connected where the Bible tells you what sin is, and when you realize it, then you confess it, First John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. That's necessary in learning it to get to truth, because truth is what sets you free from the cosmic system of lies, which is really important. Like John eight thirty two, as Jesus said. And so our Heavenly Father, we thank you tonight for these that have come our way by the automobile and by the internet. We pray for those that have attended with us on the internet. You would do classroom etiquette, show the same courtesy. Father, I pray that they would show the same courtesy of classroom etiquette as we do in the assembly. Take away the distraction, distractions uh, from an hour of study. They'll need, they'll need not to be distracted in this hour. They're going to understand this phenomenal passage. And I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth to our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this is tonight's our 50th doctrinal lesson on chapters 8, 9, and 10, uh, covering the subject of the superiority of the new covenant over the old covenant. And that's really important. I mean, this, the book of Hebrews just loaded up, but chapters 8, 9, and 10 have been phenomenal. Um, in Hebrews, the 8th chapter, verse 6, for example, he says, but the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is the mediator is superior to the old one. Talked about old covenant versus new covenant, first or second. And it is founded on better promises. That's a quote from the NIV. I think it explains it easier. What is really important to our text tonight is that it comes from Habakkuk. Verses... Uh, 37 and 38, which is the bulk of our study, comes from Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4. What you have to know about Habakkuk is that he was a contemporary prophet to Jeremiah. Both of these prophetic teachers warned the priest nation of Israel of the coming of the fifth cycle of divine discipline recorded in Leviticus 26. By Babylon, God told them that the fifth was coming and that it was coming by the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. And that's important. For example, in Habakkuk, the first chapter, verse 6, I wrote on your paper just to give you an idea. Habakkuk says, and behold, God says, behold, I am rising or raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. And so it was a pretty good description. Out, way out front. Way out front. God always gives you forewarning. He, he allows you to be forearmed before the conflict. That's why you keep coming to Bible study. You pay attention to it because the snowball is coming down the road. You need to be prepared. 
And so this is really interesting. And so he tells you that he tells them way out in advance. I'm talking about years in advance with Habakkuk. That the that I am, you know who the I am? You know who the I am is. <laughs> the I am that I am. Uh, so he says, I am I am raising up the Chaldeans to come against you. I'm just preparing them for it. I'm preparing them to be fierce, impetuous fighters. Now, if you're a righteous person who lives by faith, you don't that don't bother you. If you're not, that worries the stew out of you. Listen. David goes up against Goliath as a young guy, but full of faith. Young in years, no experience in battle, war, warfare battle, full of God, full of faith. Not just youth. The full of youth could be a lot of foolishness. He goes up against a fierce and impetuous person. Because God is almighty in him. If there's one story in the Bible that tells you that God is awesome, Goliath didn't get there on his own. God set him up so that he could shine through the life of David. It's not what rolls into your life. It's what rolls out of it. That's important. This story is going to tell us that. Tonight we're going to look at four aspects of live by faith. Notice how this thing, notice how that, here's a great line in 38. But my righteous one shall live by faith. That's a big deal. It's a big deal to God. Habakkuk is a guy. After that, everybody quotes out of Romans and out of Galatians where it's used. Paul used this all the time. And you know where it came from? Habakkuk. And you know why Paul used it? He's trying to tell the people the same thing. Just like the writer is. Do you know why the writer of Hebrews used it? He's trying to tell them the same thing. And that's really important for us to understand that. Habakkuk 2 and 3. Habakkuk 2, verse 3 and 4. Notice it there after the four aspects of live by faith. I wrote this out for you. Here's what it says. For the vision... Now, your Bible may say revelation because that's what the vision was, a vision of revelation. What is the revelation about? What is the vision about? What is the revelation about? The fifth cycle coming by whom? The Chaldeans. Here's what he says. For the vision is not yet for the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. That is the vision of the fifth coming at an appointed time like Ecclesiastes, the three cha third chapter that reminds us that everything in life, ha everything in Christ in life has an appointed time. Everything in the life of Christ has an appointed time, right? I mean, that's just, that's, in the Old Testament, they would have said it, my righteous one, for my righteous one, that is one in Christ. That's a great principle, and you should get it. Listen, the vision is not yet at the appointed time. It hastens towards the goal. It will not fail. Though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come. It will not delay. When's it going to come? Tell me, when is it, when's it going to come? At the appointed time. Now, we know historically what that appointed time was. We call it 586 B.C. Now, it came, it came you know, there are several dates connected with that, but that's the, that's the fifth cycle blow. That, that's the final blow. Listen, now that's the first part of that. Now, that's right out of Habakkuk. 
out of the New American Standard Translation. Here's the second part. This is verse, see, all that was verse 3. Here's verse 4. Behold, as the proud one, that's going to be the reversionist. Behold, as the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous. See, the proud one is, is, is contrasted to the righteous one. But the righteous one will live by faith. That's how you make it through tough times, people. That's how you make it. Tough times in your health, tough times in your marriage, tough time in your family, tough times at work, tough times, tough times, tough times. You know what the answer is? The righteous, those who take serious the will of God in their life, the righteous ones take seriously the revealed will of God in their life. We call it the directive will. They take it serious. And therefore, they live it out by faith. That's how you become overcomers. Listen. We live by faith. Romans 1, 16 and 17. See, Romans 1, 1, 16 is one of my favorite. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith. <laughs> you, know where you, got, you know where that comes from? Tell me where that comes from. Habakkuk. Uh, Habakkuk 2.4. That's where it comes from. How important is that to know? Oh. You always pay attention to where these comes from. You say, well, that's from Habakkuk 2.4. Nobody ever reads the book of Habakkuk. We just, well, it comes from Habakkuk. Habakkuk. How do you spell it? With a T? No, you don't spell it with a T. And how about Colossians 2, 6 and 7? This is a verse. This is th These are two verses you ought to have in your soul. Because Romans 1, 16 tells you how you learn faith. Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. But you see, Colossians tell you how to live it. So in Colossians, I want you to take a look at Colossians with me for a minute. I want to show you something that's really interesting about Colossians. Colossians is a is a great little this one is really good. Of course they all are, but this is good. What's this in verse six? This thing this this goes six, seven, and eight. I just use six and seven, but it goes six, seven, and eight. It says as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Now, how do you receive him? By faith. So walk in him. Didn't say walk in the world, said walk in him. You walk in Christ by faith. That's why it don't matter what he throws at you. Don't matter what the it don't matter how big the enemy is or how small he is. Then it says, watch this now. now. Now it's about faith. Watch what he says. Having been firmly rooted, firmly rooted, and being built up in him and established in your faith. See those three things? Listen, it's all about what? What's the key word? Faith. Faith has got to be firmly rooted, right? That's the story of the parable. It's got to be built up, right? And now the doctrine, building on doctrine, spiritual growth movement, from a baby to an immature to mature. That's all about the work of faith, building up, and then establishment, establishment of faith in your life. The establishment, the beachhead. The beachhead of faith in your life. It doesn't matter what he throws at you. It don't matter what the wind blows here and there, or the waves come here or there. It doesn't matter. Established. Established. Then he says, just as you were instructed and overflowing with gratitude, see to it. And then he talks about the enemy. Okay. 
Colossians 2, 6 and 7 is dynamite to the Christian life. See, we're given, a, we're given an enormous principle, live by faith. We're told to walk it out. So Paul in 2 Corinthians 5, 7 is going to say, walk by faith, not by sight. See, but we start out with faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. And once it's, once it's received, once it's received by faith, it becomes grounded and rooted, grounded for rooting, and then develops into growth and establishment of faith in your life. It is an established doctrinal principle. Dynamite stuff. Habakkuk. You talk about Habakkuk. Back a road. Point one. The background to the quote of Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4 is very important to understand the meaning of Hebrews, the 10th chapter, 37, 38, and 39. Because it is literally related to the Jewish Christian audience in the book of Hebrews, this is what's being addressed. Both Habakkuk is talking about the fifth cycle coming in 586 B.C. to the priest nation. The writer of Hebrew is looking towards that, the fifth cycle coming to them. We know it came in 70 A.D. by Rome, 586 by Babylon, the Chaldeans, and the Romans in 70 A.D. And when he's writing the book of Hebrews, we're in the 60s. We're in the mid-60s. And so... Habakkuk and the writer of Hebrews were warning their congregations of the coming of the fifth cycle of divine discipline to the priest nation of Israel. If you don't understand that, you will never understand this message. And he didn't, he had a lot of prophets he could have picked from. He didn't pick it, he didn't even pick from Jeremiah. There's a lot to pick from Jeremiah. Jeremiah in the book of Lamentations, there's a lot. He picked Habakkuk because he wanted to drive a principle of we live by faith. Both men, Habakkuk and the writer of Hebrew, were encouraging spiritual advancing believers to live by faith. Doesn't matter what you face. You don't face it alone, and you face it with promises. You never face it alone. Hebrews 13, chapter, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I mean, how uncomforting is that? You don't walk through stuff alone. You don't face this stuff alone. If nobody else is with you, the most important person is, right? You don't fight these you don't fight these things alone. Paul used the same passages, the same passage from Habakkuk 2 4, Habakkuk 2 4, in Romans 1 16 and 17, and in Galatians 3 3 11, to encourage Gentile and Jewish Christian believers to live by faith, not law. This phrase, the righteous, shall, uh, the righteous will live by his faith, this phrase became, this is the NIV, this phrase became the rally cry of the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century. It was. It was this quote from Paul in Romans and Galatians that come out of Habakkuk that fired up the Reformation. My next three points on this subject matter, on this doctrine, will require your thinking cap, if they haven't already. And what's going to be important for you to pay attention to is contrasting propositions. Propositions. Here's the first one. Point number two. The first contrasting proposition is found by comparing the Hebrew text 
to the Septuagint and then over to Hebrews 10 37. For example, the New American Standard, the King James, and the NIV say this For yet in a very little while, he who is coming, he will come, he will not delay. Do you see that? Let's go back to your first page where I quoted Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4. Now, do you see, well, I want you to see the contrast. I want you to see what he did. The vision, for the vision is not yet for the appointed time, it. See the word it? It's used six times. It's used six times. It is used as he. It's used as he three times in Hebrews 10.37. What's important for you to understand is the Septuagint Bible. The Septuagint Bible. The Septuagint Bible of Habakkuk 2.3 says this. This is a Greek translation from the Hebrew. For the vision is yet for a time, and it shall root forth at the end, and not in vain. Though he shall tarry, wait for him, for he will surely come and will not tarry. You know what he's talking about? The it is the fifth cycle that comes from the vision. The revelation of the fifth cycle is coming. And the revelation is that the Chaldeans is going to be the one to bring it. Okay, though he, the Chaldeans, should carry and wait for him, for he will surely come and will not tarry. It, the fifth cycle, is going to be brought by the Chaldeans. Now, to understand this, you have to understand their Bible is the Septuagint. And often there are variations, and the variations in here is what is coming from the Septuagint Bible because they're telling you exactly what's rolling out. The difference between it in Habakkuk 2, 3, and 4 and the he of Hebrews 10, 37, out of, as well as the Septuagint, is the difference, listen to me, in Messianic history between the first coming and the second coming of Christ. Now, you are smart enough in this room because you've studied enough with us to know about this. So I'm going to lay it out for you. What he's talking about is the first coming of Christ would come after the five, fifth cycle to, ba uh, to Babylon, to Israel. Ba Babylon will put it on Israel. The first coming of Christ would come after Babylon. Right? And that's exactly what happened. Not another king would sit on the throne of David. The throne of David is kaput during the Messianic period of the first coming, right? We all know that. The, the, the Davidic stuff is not going to come back to the second coming, the millennial. And so what the writer is talking about is very important because I'll tell you the great date is 5 B.C. when Jesus was born right? Born in Bethlehem of Judea. It's very important because what he's talking about here is this period between 586 when the fifth hit, waiting for this time of the Messiah to come, right? And that's very important to Habakkuk. That's very important to Habakkuk. The second coming of Christ will come after the fifth cycle by Rome, to the priest nation of Israel in 70 AD and after the rapture and after the seven years of tribulation, Christ will come. You see the connection? Oh, you're missing it. Gee whiz. We're talking about the fifth cycle of divine discipline to the priest nation of Israel. Listen, when Rome came in and put them under the fifth, it got, it got interrupted. That's Daniel's 70th week and the seven years of tribulation. 
the seven years of tribulation is picking up the, where the Romans left, left off, and it's going to be recycled. That's what all of this is about. It's about understanding this is going to require messianic history. You have to understand the separation of the first coming of Christ from the second coming of Christ because I'm going to tell you for the millionth time in the Old Testament, there was not a distinction between the first coming and the second coming. It was one idea. What separates the first coming from the second coming is the, is the church in biblical history. Therefore, the Eucharist is really dynamic to the church because we do this in remembrance, looking forward to the coming of Christ. Agreed? In 1 Corinthians 11. I told you you need your thinking cap. Okay? You're going to have to hear this several times to get it. How many times, William? Dan, at least 10. Yeah, <laughs> William's up the game a little bit for us. But listen, this is a lot of history. A lot of times people don't like history. Some people do. This is, this is, a, little, this is a little journey down. But listen, he only gave you two verses on it. So I've just given you a whole lot of history in a short capsule because I, I got a time limit. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the yes, you're right. You're absolutely right, William. So what when you see that this is out of Habakkuk two, three, and four, you got to go back and study Habakkuk. You've got to do a you got to have a good study Bible that lays out the introduction to Habakkuk, who he was a contemporary with, what he was doing, what his message was, what was going on. Yes. Yeah, that timeline study is dynamite for this. Yeah, it sure does. Yeah, it sure is. You, you'll find that in there. Here's, here's point three. I know. Well, this is not for the faint of heart, is it? I mean, the book of Hebrews, I, people stay away from it because of this kind of stuff. They go, I don't know what this means. What does this possibly mean? Well, somebody will come up, well, I think I know what it means. So they preach a sermon on it. Everybody goes, I don't think that means that. And there you go. Now, don't take a lot of history, but take some. As soon as they quote from Habakkuk, you got to go study Habakkuk. This is not for the faint of heart. Every time you find them quoted in Old, time script, Old, Old Testament, you got to go back and look at it. You, you haven't got any information just because you read it. Well, it come from someplace in the Old Testament. It probably doesn't matter. <laughs> you can't do that. Here's point three. The second contrasting proposition is found in Hebrews 10.38 from Habakkuk 2.4. Here's the Septuagint's account. You see how the Septuagint says it. If he, the one given the vision, they're all given a vision. They're just identifying, right? The vision, the vision. For he, one given the vision, if, if he, the one given the vision, should draw back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But the just, see, the, he's contrasted to. Do you see that? He's contrasted to. They both saw a vision. They both saw the, they both had the same revelation of the will of God concerning priest nation and the, fi, the fifth cycle coming, right? One is going to do what? Is go, go, fall back or, or draw back, right? What it says here, uh, we'll see it later how others have viewed this. My soul has no pleasure, but the just shall live by what? Faith. And notice, um, the Septuagint says, by my faith. Where other translation says, by, by the one who has the vision, the righteous one lives by his faith. You know why he put it? My faith is because faith has got to have, always has to have a working object and the authority and the structure and the fulfillment is in that. Right? And so 
the word and who stands behind the word? The one who gave this vision, see? So that's important. I mean, faith is not just some kind of gobbledygook thing out here. Well, you got to have faith. That, 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 that sings good. You got to have faith. Yeah? But how do you get it? See, how do you get it? And then once you get it, what you got to do with it? You got to walk it out in your life. Faith comes by hearing, believing, right? Applying, completing. It's a big deal. That's, Colos that's at Colossians 2, uh, 6 and 7, isn't it? It's done in a different structure way. It's kind of engineering structure, isn't it? You know, you start with a foundation, you build it up, and kind of an engineering deal. I saw it as a farm guy, but I said, well, they, everybody in here are engineers. I've got a church of engineers. When you read Hebrews, the 10th chapter 38, you will note the contrast between the righteous believer and what I've called the reversionist believer. NASB, the New American Standard Bible, when they translated Habakkuk, Two four, they said, "Behold, as for the proud one, see that the proud one." Well, this word in the Hebrew is an interesting word. This is the only time you're going to find it in this form, and it means a tumor in the colon. When it. Mm -mm. And listen, if that's cancerous, it's really it's then you're in a mess, aren't you? So this is what that refers to, and it's identified as a tumor or a swelling. And it, it's either, it's all in that area, both for women and men. This word used in another form, the same word used in another form is identified as hemorrhoids. Remember the golden hemorrhoids? <laughs> My head immediately went to a truck driver. Isn't that crazy? Uh, right there. Uh, but anyhow, it means a swelling up uh, of, uh, I don't know what it means. Uh, I don't even know where to take this right now. It. I'm going to leave it meaning swelling up, but that's what the word literally means, and that's how it's explained in Hebrew. Okay. <laughs> well, I'm not a doctor, so I don't want to get off on that subject. And but isn't it interesting how they try? Did you see how they're struggling like I am? They call it the proud one. Actually, it's the reversionist. Behold, as the proud one. His soul is not right within him, but the righteous one, in contrast, will live by faith. And so we have a contrast here again, the contrast this time between the righteous believer, my righteous one shall live by faith, and the reversionist, which in, in, the, in the New American Standard refers to him as shrink back or draw back. If he shrinks back, Draws back, it's the idea of retreat or A-W-O-L. My soul has no pleasure. This word means not, not well pleased with in him. I wrote it out in the Greek so you can see it. Here's the fourth and final point. The third contrasting proposition is the writer of Hebrews' conclusion in two parts. That's verse 39. Here's how he does it. Now he's, he's, he's wrapping this thing up. He uses day to introduce contrast with the word but. We are not of those who, those who shrink back and this is a metaphoric prepositional phrase, to destruction. Let me give you a good example of what he's talking about there that we've studied before. Luke 17, 32, remember Lot's 
wife. Also, you should read about this in Philippians 1, 28 through 30 and Philippians 3, 18 and 19. It'd be well worth your time to see what destruction. Shriek back to the story. Listen, those people who went back there, just like the writers Hebrews said, don't go back. Don't go back to the, don't go back there. In fact, I'm going to encourage you, do not go back to the law. Do not go back to the old system. It's obsolete and soon to disappear more than you might imagine. I, not only do I not want you to go back there, listen, I want you to leave this place. You don't have anything left anyhow except your own self, right? They seized all their possessions. Now it's time to go. And so you have an Acts 8-1. You're told that in Acts 1-8, and now you got an 8-1. And he tells them, get out of Dodge. Go as missionaries. Go someplace else and set up the doctrinal flag. Hoist it up to get out of here. Hand writes on a wall. We are not those who shrink back, go a wall into destruction. But in contrast of those who, of those who have faith, watch this, to the preserving of their souls. See that? You don't have to go through the fifth, and it will be terrible. You could lose your life. But you don't have to. The fifth is coming. Don't go back to that system and stay in it. You think, well, maybe I'll get some of my stuff back. This is just stuff. Just stuff. When the bombs fly, start, start hitting, you're not worried about what you're carrying away. You're just trying to get away. So let's be ahead of the game. Listen, God is always ahead of the game if you'd pay attention. He's always preparing you so that when the time comes to you go through something, you've got 1 Corinthians 10, 13, right? You are never without 1 Corinthians 10, 13. And, that, that, and that's going, those things that are coming to you, you can be well prepared to be overcomers. They do, it doesn't have to be a tank that rolls over you. God is always ahead of the game in your life. That's the importance of the word of God. You got to sit down. You got to look at things and make decisions based on the will of God. Because God ha always has our best interests at heart. Always. How do we know that? Because God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son to die in our place. He has our best interest. You should never, never think he doesn't. Probably what you're not paying attention to, and so I brought, call your attention to it, is that these two prepositional phrases tacked on the end are what we call metaphoric prepositional phrases in language. Okay? All right. Well, that's as far as I'm going tonight with you. Yes, that's that's what Philippians three eighteen and nineteen says. They become they become enemies. Listen, if they stay, they become enemies. They don't have to be. Okay. Well, let's let's close this out with a word of prayer, and then we'll do our our prayer personal prayer time. Father, there are clear choices through the word of God. We can go AWOL on, on the revealed will of God, the vision, the revelation that God gives us to our life that's important to our daily living. Or we can be righteous, step up the plate, and live by faith. Live by faith. Because faith engages God Faith comes by hearing, hearing the word of God. Faith engages God. And there's nothing greater than God. No situation in our life is greater than God. Not only do we need to have him with us and beside us and always. But we need to have him actively engaged with us. It's not 
you know, Father, it's one thing as we, we face Goliath, but we have to be bold. We have to be people of faith. We can't sit down and figure out how to beat that man. Can't figure it out. And so David picks up a stone. He throws it with a prayer. And it's all over. Because faith always wins the day. It always wins the day. What a wonderful test that was in David's life. Because King Saul wanted to use the weapons of warfare. And David knew he had to use the weapon of faith. We need to be those kind of people. Not who shrink back in the, in the time of danger and adversity and conflict. Not the ones who get, go AWOL on faith. But those who step up boldly and courageously. Knowing that God is in charge. That we represent him in his glory. Caleb and Joshua tells them as they go out as spies and come back. This is a piece of cake for God. Those who shrank back, they shrunk back to grasshoppers. Whether they're six feet or seven feet, they, they become gra the size of a grasshopper. Because of the way they thought. We don't need to be those people who shrink back into nothing land when we're in the forever land. So, Father, help us live by faith. Help us live by faith. Can't do it without Bible study. Can't do it without Bible study. Got to cycle that word of God. You got to cycle it. The word of God has got to become faith and cycled out from learning to living. Teach us that, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.